this is the cgbytes.com spotlight interview and uh, as I said in part one we're doing a little bit different this time we're doing a audio video interview embracing the future folks and uh, let us know in the comments section you know let us know do you like this this method or would you just like to rather read stuff because if you like this we'll, we'll make more <laughs> so now uh, our next question what was the most challenging product that you've ever created or wanted to create, even if you never got a chance to release it publicly? Yeah, um, there's a lot of products, but actually the, the most challenging thing that I think I've ever, ever worked on was um, uh, for a friend. Well, he started out as a client. One of the few times that a client actually ends up becoming um, – you know, a really, a really good friend, a, a gentleman named Tony Luke, who anyone who follows me on Facebook has probably seen, you know, a, a lot of posts from me in the last week or so about Tony because um, he he just passed away last week from a, a prolonged battle with cancer. And when I when I mean prolonged, I mean I've been working with Tony for ten years, uh, ten years plus, um, and he already had uh, he actually was diagnosed with cancer in 2000 it was mesothelioma and uh, the guy had actually uh, when i met him had already lost uh his right lung to it as well as having his diaphragm replaced with plastic jesus and yet dude was still walking around we were at uh, san diego comic con together in 2005 nice. um and uh you know, dude's still walking around doing everything anybody else would do and just loving life, man. He was great. Um, probably if I had to look back on my career to date, I would say at least in the last 10 years in the time that I've known him, maybe my entire career, but definitely in the last 10 years, the single most important, uh, um, you know, person maybe outside my wife, um, you know, to, to have a role in, in my career. I mean, dude was just so good to me through the years and became such close friends. We worked together constantly and yeah, losing him has been, been a real blow. Um, guy was, we, I mean, we literally were like brothers. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I'll, I kind of get diverted when I start talking about him, but to answer the question, no, um, back a few years ago, we were working on a uh, movie together and um, an animated film for a character of his called Dominator, and uh, there was a there was a call in the script for an interpretation of Lucifer or Satan, and so uh, when we talked about it, I did concept art for it, and, and uh, I was most of his projects. I was his technical director um, slash character designer i actually worked uh, through him worked with a guy named uh, um uh, yasushi nirasawa um who worked on akira classic anime um i think i'm pretty sure it was akira and a bunch of other stuff i know he also worked on some devil man stuff but um so like there was myself and there was nira nirasawa doing uh, concepts and then i would uh make them happen in 3d so that Tony and his animators over in England could, uh, could then use them. So, um, this one particular interpretation of Lucifer ended up, um, Tony had said, um, of course I, I still hear him talking about it. It's kind of makes me a little sad, but it's cool. It's a good thing to remember. Uh, Tony had, had talked about, um, how he wanted it to have a human head, have one head, but three faces. And the center face had to be this Bishonen, effeminate male human head, while the um, uh, the other two, the right head, would be a uh, uh, demonic canine, and the left head would be a um, uh, giant, the the head of a giant fly with a working proboscis. <laughs> nice, nice. So. Um, there was that, but then there was more because, uh, stylistically he was going for this thing where the, uh, where it would have this, uh, clothing style reminiscent of like Hellraiser. Um, uh, I think maybe part of that was because, uh, uh Doug Bradley, a guy who uh, has played pinhead forever and a day was, um, voicing some, uh, 
at least one, maybe two characters in the project. Um, <laughs> right but uh, uh, so uh, he said, you know, he's like, I want this Bishonin sort of face. I want these other two. Um, I want you to, and he said, I want you to think Hellraiser meets anime meets William Blake. And no, oh, no, nice. uh, not a, not a tall order. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Thanks, dude. Uh, and it was always cool because he would throw crap like that at me. He'd be like, "Les, Les, you know, I, I'd really like to hear. I'd really like to see what you would do with something that's sort of this this anime meets meets uh, Hellraiser meets William Blake." And I'm like, <laughs> "Tony, I, I love you, but kind of hate you, man." I'm going be, to oh, I know, you, I know you can do it. I know you can do it, mate. You can you can do anything. I know you can do it. You'll, you'll you'll knock this out of the park. I know you'll do it. And he'd, you know he'd, he'd like throw American euphemisms at me sometimes. It was always funny, especially when he would use them wrong. That was always great. Right, right. But, uh, but uh, so um, anyway, designed this thing. It ended up being like I tend to keep my poly counts super low on stuff, and I'm very frugal. But this thing ended up being three hundred and three hundred fifty, three hundred sixty thousand polys. Uh, because here's this full figure with goat legs. It had six tails. They were really tentacles that came off from various places around its waist. It had six wings like the biblical seraphim. Uh, it had the three heads, all of which had to be capable of full speech. Um, meanwhile, the fly still has a working proboscis. Um, then there's the clothing that kind of builds up out of its skin that is this leathery um, kind of Hellraiser bondage type stuff, but is also covered in like all these different kinds of spikes and armor plates and um, barbed wire. And then there's these shells, like instead of a waistcoat or waist cape sort of thing, there are these shells that stuff could, that could close up around parts of it. And it was insane. It was insane. The entire uh, joint count on this thing ended up being like 360, 370, somewhere uh, up in the uh, upper mid 300s um, number of bones hmm. that that it took to rig all this stuff and make this thing work. Wow! Uh, it was it was intense. It was <laughs> it was the most intense figure I've ever built. And the scary part is that was in two thousand seven. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's a concept I actually would love to like go back and rebuild today because I know now, you know, with, with, you know, the advances in technology, even just since 2007, oh my God, the, the way that we could realize that thing now, just, there's just so many things that could be made even better. But yeah, it, it it's still, even though that was, God, man, it was nine years ago, still stands up as one of the most, uh, challenging things i've ever had to work on um you know it, it, just, it, it definitely sounds nuts. like a challenge right there it was nuts it was kind of nuts um so as far as products go things that have actually been released as as products i would have to say cthulhu cthulhu <laughs> cthulhu cthulhu is up there only because um like th there were shortcuts that one could take with cthulhu and I hate that. I, I really hate that. I do not like shortcuts in my products. Um, I mean, it's, it's funny. I put a lot of things into my products that I think a lot of users may never actually stumble onto. <laughs> um, but it's stuff that is important to me because my goal is um, I'm going to make a product that I would want to use in an animation production. Right. So... Uh, there's a lot of things I take into consideration with that that I think really yields yields a kind of product that has a usefulness to it that is maybe a little you know a, a little more than what people are used to getting and and that since they're not used to that they don't know to look for certain things or don't know to use them or so on but with Cthulhu he has a b c d e five wait there was I think six. 12, I want to say there was either 10 or 12 tentacles coming off of his face. Mm. Uh, and then they're all easy pose, you know, remote controlled easy pose stuff. But then on top of the easy pose, because I mean, it's, you know, it's like there's there's tricks now where anybody can 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 use uh, 
a couple of different utility programs that are around to do easy post stuff and things like that. And that's great. I, I'm glad that's, that's there. But even so with easy post stuff, it's still, you know, it's, it's still a lot of work to use all those tentacles and all those different controls. So what I did is I, I built a control scheme where you'd have these, um, I believe it's on, yeah, it's on his head. Um, if you unfold these little, uh, dial groups on the character's head, there's groups that control the, that actually drive the ERC controls on all the different tentacles and then allow you to control them in almost as granular a way as you can joint by joint or with the controls that are on them, but you can do it all from on his head. So it's, it's kind of, you know, setting all that stuff up was, was kind of, uh, actually a little trickier than you would think it would be. And then of course his wings function, you know, um, I'm real peculiar and picky about wing function on characters like that. Um, yeah, Cthulhu, Cthulhu was, was a challenge and, uh, it was a challenge. We've actually done a couple different iterations of the concept. Uh, we did the first Cthulhu. I know that there are some folks out there who have a competing Cthulhu and I just I'm going to be a gentleman and wish them well, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, we did the first Cthulhu for Poser all the way back in 2003. And, and it still I, holds up today. Well, th that was the first one. And it, one of the things that we do that I, I don't know if anybody else does this or not, because I don't really pay attention to other vendors. I know it's not a slight against them. I just don't want to be too influenced by what other people do. That's a good thing. Um, which, I, it, you know, it's a blessing and a curse because it's a blessing because we managed to stay pretty original by doing that it's a curse in a way because i don't really pay attention to the market yeah so like it's, the, it's, the market it's hard for you to sell what's what's the flavor of the month uh, yeah yeah if and, i and, had to come down and just say all right let's make a popular product you know it's kind of hard to know what's popular that at that time frame yeah i, I i'm never like if someone says so you know you want to make uh, this baseline of income next month what are you going to make i'm like i don't know but check this out this is really cool yeah, that's I'm gonna, what i'm making i'm gonna make yeah. stuff and things and more exactly. stuff i'm gonna make all the cool things right and leave the really commercial things typically up to everybody else <laughs> that's not a bad bad thing per se I mean, and, and it's not, it's actually not even a slight against people who make commercial things. It's just, it's just not where my heart's at typically, you know? And, and if I'm not, if I'm not happy with what I'm making, then I'm not happy making it. And, and that just doesn't, doesn't work for me. You know, I'm just, maybe I'm too artsy fartsy like that or whatever, but I don't care. That's how <laughs> yeah. it is. Uh, but, but no, with, uh, Cthulhu, we've actually, we're at our third iteration of Cthulhu now. Mm-hmm. And uh, because what we'll do is, you know, like, like first one came out in 2003. Well, he was great for 2003. But then a couple of years go by, technology changes, techniques change, my skills grow, so on and so forth. And I'm like, man, I'll start looking back at him and he's looking kind of dated. So do a new one. And then we shelved the old one. Um, uh, there's actually a huge, huge amount of content. Uh, at least at least a couple hundred figures uh that we've had out uh since 2000 i don't know 2002 2003 there's a huge huge catalog of those that are just sitting on a hard drive here that that aren't available to the public anymore because um you know a lot of not all of those are retired products some of them still actually need to be brought back out and released in places but probably a good chunk of those are things that are retired. They will not be released again, or if they are, it'll only be through these things we call Sixus vintage bundles right that, you know, that are released with the caveat that this is reflective of work from this era of, of the studio. So, you know, understand, you know, this is, this is really for nostalgia. Right. You know, right. You want, if you want something high quality, you get our newer stuff because this is, this is what this is for. Right. So, uh, but yeah, the, the newest, this is funny. It's my son again, the newest Cthulhu, I designed it and I, and I worked on it, but it's actually about 50, 50 him and me. Like I designed most of it. Um, a lot of my creatures, I actually design on paper first. I, I, I draw incessantly and, um, uh, and I, I drew up, you know, ideas on Cthulhu and then was like, okay, Killian, I want you to do this, you know? Um, 
and uh, well, actually, actually, it wasn't quite that easy. He bugged me about it. He was, he was looking at you like, hey, Dad, I want to do the new Cthulhu. I want to do the new Cthulhu. I'm like, kid, this is Cthulhu. This is a signature for this us. This is an elder god, man. Yeah, Are like, you nuts? Like, this, is, this is Cthulhu. This is the flagship of our mythos line. I can't hand that over to you yet. And he bugged me about it for a year. And finally, I was like, okay, here's the damn deal. You sculpt something based on this. You could take some liberties, but you sculpt it. And if I like what I see, then I'll let you move to the next step with it. He's like, okay. And he he poured his heart into trying to make me happy with a new version of Cthulhu that would just be a showstopper. And uh, it was it was kind of great because I've never I, I actually can't remember the last time I saw him. Like I don't think there's anything he's ever worked on that to him was more indicative of our business and important to really kind of make me happy with than that Cthulhu was. And man, he knocked it so far out of the park. Nice. I mean, it just like I I, I use it. I love it. And and I'm like I'll, I'll do artwork with it for myself. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, this is this is our, you know, this is my Cthulhu. Wait, no, this is our Cthulhu. Oh crap! Wow, that's Killian did that. You know, it's like this is cool. This is so weird and and cool and neat. And you know, but uh, it's also kind of a weird feeling though when uh, you know it's like with Cthulhu. That was the point at which I'm like, okay, uh, you know, you've got the skills now that we can. I really don't need to show you as much, you know. We can go on to you learning different things, you know. So that was that was really neat. Yeah. But uh, but it was a, it was still like like I rigged it and I think I I contributed to it. I rigged it and did um, I really guided him a lot on things with it because it was you know such an important thing to us. And then uh, I know his final textures. I kind of went back over a little bit, and he and I bounced back and forth with some of that stuff, and uh, which is cool. It's actually I've never had that before. I've never had somebody who I worked with like that before, you know, where I could be texturing something, and they'd be like, "Oh, here, let me work on it for a little bit because I see where I could do this, that, and the other." And so it's it's just you know it's just an extra benefit that it's my son that I get to do that with. So mm, nice. it's really cool. Now, along the lines of the Cthulhu and the Mythos series, what led you to create the Mythos series in its entirety? Um, well, really, um, my heart has always been in horror, uh, just horror, you know, whether it's my comics, uh, like even when I do science fiction, my science fiction is still, it, it's horror with spaceships. So, um, you know, it's you Lovecraft. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't be a horror fan like that and not love Lovecraft. I mean, yeah, it's, just it's like thing. Lovecraft with horror, Geiger for horror and sci-fi. It's, well, I mean, you know, I yeah. mean, Geiger, Geiger is still Lovecraft. Yeah, I mean, Geiger is Lovecraftian. Geiger pulled in, inspirations from Lovecraft and you know did things that were you know ref, that were actually representing Lovecraft at times, and and it's just like. Yeah, man, freaking Lovecraft is, uh, from a literary standpoint, people don't realize just how deep the influence of Lovecraft has been in in uh, in culture beyond just horror. I mean, a lot of his stuff was really science fiction, and um, and then with the uh, the shared community of writers who he shared like letter writing with in the twenties and thirties, you know, people don't realize like when you watch Conan. I love Conan. I absolutely adore Conan. Conan's world, the Hyborian Age, is the ancient world of of uh, Lovecraft settings. So, because uh, he and Robert E. Howard, you know, they they were friends and they wrote to each other, and he would make reference to something in a story, and Robert E. Howard would say, "Hey, I'm going to borrow that idea and flesh it out in my Hyborian Hi stuff." Mm -hmm. So, it's just really there's so many different ways. Like, I got to actually talk about Lovecraft for hours it's obscene uh, i'll give you a quick one i have in my possession three albums from the hp lovecraft historical society they are oh. christmas songs a very nice. scary solstice an even scarier solstice and shogoth on the roof 
Oh my they're, god. They're literally... Shook off on the roof is awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's literally a bunch of Cthulhu and Elder God Lovecraftian themed Christmas carols. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it didn't ring any bells until you said shook off on the roof, and I'm like, oh my god, that's awesome. That's so yes. great. Yep. Yeah, I, the... Um, the, the whole mythos line for us was really just this giant labor of love because of, you know, uh, Rebecca and I are both just crazy horror geeks. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things. It's like, you know, it's like, well, well, crap, man, you know, this is 2002, 2003. Hey, we're making original figures. Hey, you know what? Lovecraft is public domain. Most of it. You know, well, the mythos concepts are public domain. Anybody can do a Cthulhu concept. So here we go. Yeah, let's roll. <laughs> so we started with Cthulhu and then went to, um, I think, uh, Nyarlathotep, who is... Um, my Nyarlathotep is probably my favorite of all the mythos figures that we've done, actually. Of that and, and the new Cthulhu with Kill Him. Um, because the, our concept of Nyarlathotep came out just crazy kinds of creepy looking. He has this flip top sort of head and three legs and is just one of the most bizarre things I've ever made. It, it's he, that's actually the only figure I've ever made that honestly sometimes creeps me out. <laughs> nice. like, oh, that's, that's just, yeah. So, but with, also with the mythos, you know, one of the things that's kind of a tradition for folks who are into Cthuliana I love that word. It's just you, know, you guys. Cthuliana. Let that roll off the tongue. Cthuliana. Uh, Cthuliana. Oh, very well. Suddenly, you immediately gain IQ points if you can make it sound like that. <laughs> cool, I'm smart. <laughs> like, look, I sound like I went to college. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, one of the traditions with Cthulhu stuff, or it's kind of a tradition now, is people, you know, making their own additions to it and kind of contributing and expanding the mythos. Um, I mean, writers like Robert Block and Brian Lumley and guys like that. And really, outside of art, you know, I, I also write quite a bit. And, you know, writing and music are my other passions. And I love writing horror. So one of the things that I did with the mythos line was took it as an opportunity to sort of invent my own little corner of that world. And, um, uh, so along with characters like Cthulhu and Sathagua, Nyarlathotep, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the elder thing, those are so freaking weird. Um, you know, some right. of these characters, uh, uh, we did Gugs, we did, uh, uh, Night Gaunts, uh, Bayaki. I mean, we've really just plumbed the depths of the whole mythos thing. But along with that, we also, um, I took the opportunity to uh, to write some short stories here and there and put them up in different places and uh, and then release products that kind of uh, build out of those. Like uh, one of our best-selling products to date. And it blows my mind that this thing caught on um, is a, a uh, figure that I called Nylagast. I was waiting and waiting. I couldn't remember how to pronounce it. And I'm like, he's going to say it. He's going to say it. That's it. That is my... Yeah friggin' favorite right there along yeah, the, with his temple his temple set oh just, yeah oh just phenomenal thanks man yeah the the nylagast uh i don't know did you ever did you ever see the short story that goes with it i probably did at one point but i can't there, remember off the top of my head but yeah there there's actually two environment kits that go with him there was the there was the uh the layer of the nylagast the temple looking thing right uh but then there's also one that's called the decrepit room mm. And it's this kind of, it looks like this rancid old attic sort of thing. It's really kind of inspired in part by the attic room that Frank uh, um, dies and comes back in in uh, Hellraiser. Yes. Um, because, you know, Frank was a bastard. But uh, <laughs> Hey, now, he was just uh, misunderstood and needed a hug. Exactly. But only with his skin on. Yes, uh, yes, yes. But, uh... uh <laughs> But the decrepit room, uh, there's this short story that I wrote, and I actually created this character who I've used off and on since 2003. Um, at one point, I actually released a uh, kit of him for M4, one of the few M4 kits I've ever done. Um, 
but he's a character of mine called Dr. Horace Van Meter. And he's sort of the central figure in my end of the, of the Cthulhu mythos. Um, there's some short stories up on sixes1.com that, uh, that feature Horace Van Meter. Um, also folks may not realize this. There's also this other horror series of ours called, um, the specimen. <laughs> from the and facilities, the, the facility the, line. The, yeah, the spe- the specimen and the facility are actually subsets of the mythos. Mm. There, there's actually stories that I've wrote that they all tie together. There, the the specimen are actually uh, beings brought, uh, are, are entities inhabiting people that were brought here by Doctor Van Meter. Nice, nice. And, uh, yeah, it, it's weird. I know one of the things that I do with products that, that I think I, – I don't know if any – again, I don't pay attention to other people's stuff, so I don't know if anybody else does this. But um, I have this tendency to do product lines that have a story to the whole line. I really think that helps to helps not only present them, but I think it also helps to sell them too. Because, you know, you can go see a bar, right, a bar product and go, oh, this is a really nice bar. I, I got it. it. It's great. But – I just don't know what I could do with it. But then you yeah. see that same bar with a backstory. You go, oh, you know, I could actually expound on this. What, what if my my favorite character is at that bar and blah 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 blah? And you can just, you know, it it it's almost acts as like a muse to a point. Oh yeah. Well, so and, I think it's a definitely a great thing, and I, I think more people need to try to do something like that. Because yeah, without even going out and looking, I can tell you, not hardly anybody does that. And, you know, I, I think we're – like, it, it was always a natural thing for me, just that's how I wanted to do it. Um, but it didn't dawn on me, actually, what the inspiration for that was until I, I think it's probably at a family function of some sort or a party or something. And, you know, oh, it's always great fun trying to explain to people, so what do you do for a living? Well, I, <laughs> I, make, you know, I, make, <laughs> I make things. Yeah. Well, and so stuff. I – stuff. And it dawned on me one night, I was like, I explained it to somebody, I was like, well, think of what I do as being like, and, and this may offend some people who, who you know, who, and there are plenty of people who use this stuff who are great artists with it, and this is not meant as a slight, but what I said was, think of it as, as digital action figures. Um, basically, I design these things, and I build them, and then people can download them and play with them. I know lots of people who I've talked to through the years who are long-standing customers who barely ever render anything, but they love to just open them up and move them and play with them like toys. You know, I can actually I can get behind that, and I yeah. I don't think anybody would actually be offended by that. I mean, it's it, yeah, it's, and it, it's it's not a slight at all. Yeah, it's no, like, no. For God's sakes, look at the artistry in McFarlane toys. Those things are gorgeous. Oh my God, I had all of them to my oldest child was born, and my ex-wife made me get rid of them because it scared the child. Oh, I had the yeah, entire no, original line. See. See, I, I'm very fortunate doing this stuff that my kids grew up with it, and you know, like my like Killian when he was nine, got to talk on the phone with Doug. Nice. So, you know, it was like he was like, yeah, it was it was so great. You know, I'm on the phone with Doug Bradley one day, and and he, and, and I was like, I was like, oh, Doug, Killian's been watching Hellraiser since he was three. He loves you. And, <laughs> and, and he thought that was hilarious. Did, did like, you have him say? Did you have him say the line? I have well, such I, sights I like, to show you. I was like, you. Uh, I was like. Would you talk to Killian for a second? He'll freak out, <laughs> you know. And and uh, and he's like, oh, he's like, uh, he's like, hand hand me over. And uh, I was like, Killian, come here. And he comes in, and I, I'm like, his son, there's somebody on the phone for you. He's like, for me, he's like, I said, he's like nine. And I could hear, you know, from 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 the phone when I hand it to him. Doug goes, hello, Killian. <laughs> Killian's eyes lit up, and he's like, greetings <laughs> from hell. Nice. And Killian was like, oh, is, this, <laughs> is it you? Is it Doug? <laughs> and then he's like, hello, Killian. And just start talking his normal voice. And Killian was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was so cool. He was like just absolutely freaking out and loving it. And they talked for a minute. And then, and then after I got off the phone, Killian is still in the office. And, you know, he's nine years old. And he just looks at me and goes, Dad? You have the coolest fucking job ever. <laughs> please, please bleep me there, but, but he did, and I and I'm you know and I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, I should really, I should really say something about his language, but yes, uh, Dad's got a great job, man. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, 
But yeah, with the the mythos stuff and the stories and all that, you know, the, the Horace Van Meter was a character. Actually, the first time I wrote a Van Meter thing was uh, uh, it was a story around this product I did for uh, Behemoth. Now, now, the first human figure we actually no, it's not. God, the first human figure we ever released was a character called Adam, all the way back in like two thousand four, mm-hmm. two thousand three, two thousand four. God, it's been so long. Uh, there was there was Adam, and then there was Lillian, and then shortly after that, actually no, before them, Behemoth was the first. Behemoth, um, yeah, be, we released Behemoth for free, actually before Daz had the freak and and that stuff about a month before, but I don't like to talk about that. <laughs> um, but uh, the um, you know we did we've done a few different products for Behemoth through the years, and there was one of them that was real cool kind of warrior um well we've actually got one now called the warrior lich but this was a warrior lich sort of idea um called the necro fiend and um and there was this whole uh thing i actually still have the thumbnails and at some point i'm going to draw up a comic based on a short story you know like a six-page comic um called the rise of the necro fiend uh and in it it was um this this guy being resurrected and his power tapped by uh, by Doctor Horace Van Meter. It was this whole cool thing, this kind of 1920s archaeologist deal. Nice. Yeah, it was it was great fun. It was just great fun. But uh, the, through the years, I've just written more and more Horace Van Meter stuff, and like introduced different like like different heroic characters that are the foil to. His. I, I love this idea of having you know a series of writings, a series of stories, and and, and products and things where they really are about the villain. You know, the villain is the star. You know, he's he's a he's a complete bastard. And uh, but uh, yeah, on on our site, there's some writing up there, some re- some more recent stuff, getting longer and longer form. Um, and uh, the the species uh, or species specimen series is actually an outgrowth of Van Meter, which is Lovecraft. You know, which is mythos. So it's really weird in a way because when you look back, probably a good third to half of our catalog through the years is in some way related to Lovecraft. Right on. So it's kind of why like, like Lovecraft in this, in the context of this whole, you know, um, art form hobby or whatever kind of Lovecraft is kind of, that's, that's my turf. (laughs) That's my home people. (laughs) You know, it's like you in my house. (laughs) It's Lovecraft, baby. (laughs) <laughs> Lovecraft baby. Oh, God. <laughs> hey, you, you, you set it up. I had to go there. Oh man! But let's but, uh, uh, let's let's break here. And everybody, thanks for listening to part two. I want you to go down to the description there and press the link for part three, or just go ahead and hit next, or you know whatever you need to do. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you in part three. <laughs>